Okay, so it looks like we have a bunch of names coming in. I think everyone knows the instructions to share their first and last name in the chat. And we will go ahead and jump into the presentation. So again, for those of you who are just joining, my name is Rachel Skipper. I'm the Assistant Director of Undergraduate Recruitment for the College of Arts and Sciences in Maxwell. That means I know a lot about Syracuse and a little bit about all of our majors. I also know about the application review process and admissions. So I'm a good person to ask with those questions. But more importantly for tonight's session, we have two Syracuse professors. Laura Macchia, who's here to represent the Department of Psychology. She is the director of our undergraduate program for psychology majors. So she cares a lot about the student experience, about what classes you're gonna be taking. And she also teaches her own classes. So she's a good representative for you to learn a lot from tonight. Similarly, we have Dr. Robin Jones, who is the director of our neuroscience integrated learning major. And she's, she's gonna be telling you more about what that means tonight. But essentially, if you wanna be a neuroscience major, she will have had a hand in helping design that program, same as uh, Dr. Machia, in making sure that we, our students are having a good experience with us as neuroscience students. So I'm going to go ahead and hand the mic over first to Dr. Machia, who's going to be telling you again about our psychology program. And like I mentioned, if you missed this earlier in the session, feel free to share your questions with us in the chat as you have them. And one of us will get back to you in the chat and answer those questions. All right, always the high pressure moment here. I'm gonna try and share my screen and share the correct version of it. Are you seeing a presentation? Yes, okay, thank you, perfect. All right, I'm gonna take you guys, sorry, I have a two screen thing, but I like seeing people's faces. So I'm moving you all over here on top of my screen so I can see you. Okay, awesome. So thanks for being here um, tonight. So uh, as Rachel mentioned, my name's uh, Dr. Laura Mesha. I'm the Director of Undergrad Studies in Psychology. And I'm excited to tell you about our program today. So I've prepared just a few slides, but um, you know, ask any question at all, even if it wasn't covered in these slides. Hopefully this gives you a good overview. I'm also always available if you have additional follow-up questions either during the session or if you think of them after, or you'd rather email me. All of that is fine with me. So I'll just go ahead and dive in here. So I wanna start by talking about the degree options that we have in psychology at Syracuse. We offer both the BA, Bachelor of Arts, and the Bachelor of Science. Learning the differentiation between the two of them can be a good way to learn what we offer at all. So this is a good way to segue to talk about our curriculum here. Our Bachelor of Arts um, is where I will start. This, uh, degree. Uh, to, to, to obtain this degree, you'll take classes in Introduction to Psychology. Many of you may have taken this like in SUPA or um, get AP credit or transfer credit in for it. So not everyone takes Introduction here at Syracuse, but if not, if you have no um, psychology credit previous to now, you'll start with Introduction to Psychology, one of our really popular classes on campus. Then um, all psychology majors take Methods and Statistics. These are our kind of our core of the science component of our, of our discipline, where we learn how to like interpret um, the research in the field and how to actually conduct the research well. These give you some really valuable school uh, skills and tools or stools apparently is what I decided to call that. That's a nice portmanteau of it. Uh, that will you know, help you through the rest of your, your classes here. Then there's the content base. Students find these classes usually um, pretty fun. These are our topic classes where we teach you the kind of content and, and theories and findings of psychology. So you'll take four of those here. Social psychology, where you study things like romantic relationships, intergroup relationships, prejudice, bias, attitudes, persuasion, um, anything to do with social interactions is in that social class. Cognitive. This is where you'll learn about things like memory, learning, um, why you can never find your keys when you're about ready to leave. That'll be cognitive psychology. Then we have childhood psychology. This is a more general developmental class. It's how we develop, how we kind of become uh, the people we are. And then abnormal psych, where we get into the um, psychological disorders and uh, abnormal processes that happen. After those four, um, students take electives and what we call advanced electives. Advanced electives are designated as such because they have one of these content-based courses as their prerequisite. So they're a deep dive. If you really liked your social class and you wanna know more, well, we have a whole class just on close relationships. We have a whole class just on stigma, prejudice. 
We have a whole class just on advanced social methods, if just the research of social is exciting to you. So each one of these content-based classes, you can dive deeper if that's your area of interest. If it's abnormal, which for most people it is, we have intro to clinical psychology if you think you wanna go that route um, in classes that help you prepare for a career in clinical psychology. Okay, so that's our Bachelor of Arts, gives you a nice well-rounded idea of psychology, prepares you for graduate school in psychology, prepares you for medical school, prepares you for entering the workforce, but having a really strong background and understanding human behavior in psychology. But some of you uh, may already be thinking, I wanna take more math and science classes just in general. Those are the kinds of things I like. I like math, I like science. In which case our BS might be a good option for you, our Bachelor of Science. It's really, really similar to our BA but what you take on top of it in the psychology department is a lecture lab sequence. This is six credits of courses that really dive deeply into the methods of one of these four areas. So maybe you'll take um, a childhood lecture lab where you get more information on how research with children is conducted. And then simultaneously you take a lab where you're doing projects with research with data collection with children. So you're like actually involved in the data collection. Um, BS students also outside of the psych department take uh, a natural science lecture lab sequence and then nine extra um, electives in natural sciences. So this would be a good, this is a good degree. I recognize students who've taken significantly more science mathematics and laboratory courses than is required for our BA, but it's not necessary for graduate school in psychology. It's not necessary for medical school or other programs like that. It's just a good option we have if you're already somebody who wants to go deeper into the scientific aspect of things. Along with these degree options within the psych department, we connect to other departments um, at Syracuse in a very interesting way with this idea of this integrated learning major. You'll learn more about this in a minute when Dr. Jones talks, so I'm not going to go too into this, but a lot of psychology majors declare an additional major, an integrated learning major in either neuroscience. We also have a strong connection with the forensic science um, integrated learning major, which is a combination between us and chemistry uh, and anthropology and a few other uh, fields. Like I said, you'll hear more about neuroscience in a minute. So I'll leave that there as an amuse bouche for now. So what do you do with a psych degree is always a fair question now that I've told you what our degree options are. Um, of course, you can be a psychologist, right? That's the like kind of, I've kicked the can down the road. I've defined the career outcome by the degree itself. What I mean by psychologist is you might be um, an applied hands-on interacting with clients or patients or something along those lines types. So you might be a clinician, you might be a school psychologist, you might be a sports psychologist, a forensic psychologist. So you might actually follow up with advanced um, training in psychology to become that. But it's a really, really versatile degree. So that's what I want to emphasize here. Even if the being a psychologist goal isn't one you have, um, having training in psychology is useful for myriad career paths. In business, we see that people who work in advertising, in market research, in sales, who have a psychology background do really well. We see that people who go into education, maybe they're a career counselor, obviously having a psychological background is strong there as well. Human services, what I mean by this is you could be um, like a probation or parole officer in law enforcement. Maybe you're a rehabilitation specialist. Maybe you're a case manager. Maybe you're a social worker, something where you're um, interacting with people and helping connect them with services uh, in the community. And then finally, we're seeing more and more people with psychology backgrounds go into tech fields. So working on user experience. So why is Facebook doom scrolling so addictive is something that a psychologist would be able to really help you know about and make more addictive if that's interesting to you. Um, how to influence people um, through technology as well. So it's a, so an incredibly versatile degree that gives you a strong background to go on as a psychologist or elsewhere. So if you come to SU, what kind of support exists for you? Um, I wanna tell you just a little bit about our advising and your advising network when you're an SU student in the psychology program, psychology um, major. So we have a three-pronged advising um, 
structure in psychology. First, you have um, CAS advising. CAS is the College of Arts and Science, the, the college in which um, psychology is housed at Syracuse. These advisors are professional advisors. They're, they stay up to date on major requirements, the core requirements for arts and science beyond psychology, so the other classes you would take um, to graduate. They take care of major and core advising hold removal. They give you academic planning to make sure, oh, you want to take these two majors in this minor. Here's how we're going to get all those classes in in your four years here. Uh, they can also provide career guidance. They stay up on that. It's a really collaborative relationship. I meet with the advisors at least once a semester. I met with them earlier this week to tell them what's up with our spring schedule and how to advise students to navigate it. So it's a very collaborative department with these professional advisors to make sure you know what classes to take and what you can do after. We don't just pawn everything off on these professional advisors though. In-house in the psychology department, we also have psychology drop-in advisors. So we have a staff of about five um, staff members who help majors with their major and minor declaration forms, with psychology major requirement reviews. We look at transfer credit petitions if you took a class elsewhere. We help you navigate the study abroad um, requirements. We'll take care of any petitions you have, add drop forms, and get you connected to psychology faculty, which is the last prong of this advising scheme, which is the faculty mentoring. Every psychology major on campus is assigned a faculty mentor. So you'll have at least one psychology faculty member who out of the gate from day one is committed to meeting with you as regularly as you'd like to discover your professional interests, to talk to you about what you might wanna do with a psychology degree, give you guidance in class selection to make sure you're taking the right classes for the kind of um, career path you're envisioning, and just answer general questions about the major, about your career options, about graduate school, about research. So of course you'll interact with more faculty than just your faculty mentor while you're here. If you find someone else that you can get mentorship from, great. But if not, there's always this one person who's assigned and this is part of their job and part of their role to make sure that you get your questions answered. Um, we also do a fair amount of shuffling with our faculty mentors as we learn more about you. So it's often the case that I, a social psychologist, will be assigned somebody as a faculty mentee who then says, oh, I really wanna be a school psychologist. And I say, well, this is foolish. Let's get you with one of our school psychologists. And so we'll swap um, students around and make sure they're with a faculty mentor who has the best expertise for helping you achieve your educational and career goals. Okay. It's not all about the class experience though with psychology at Syracuse. It's a really vibrant community. Um, we have clubs and organizations and we put on events regularly for undergraduates to engage them, um, to engage you with your peers. So other undergraduate psych majors with similar interests, as well as with the faculty and graduate students in the program um, as well. So we have a psychology club. This is a registered student organization. It has a student led um, e-board. Uh, I forget what the E stands for, election board, no. Uh, executive board probably, um, but it's a, yes, thank you. It's a group of students who lead this organization. So they come up with programming each year, they come up with ideas and they ask for faculty assistance to put on the events um, that they wanna do. So next week, for example, they're putting on a movie night. I uh, unfortunately tried to look it up at the last minute, but I forgot um, today. I forget which movie it is, but I know they've recruited a few faculty to come talk about the psychological implications of the movie. Uh, that they're showing. And so, you know, it's virtual because of COVID, but in a, in a normal world where hopefully we get back to at some point, you know, if you bring groups together who care about the same topic, to talk about psychology, have faculty kind of chime in about the, psych the background of it. We also have events that are just designed by the psychology faculty for undergraduates. Um, we have a faculty committee called the Undergraduate Engagement Committee. Um, we've put on trivia nights in the past, psychology trivia. So it's not like fun, but it is, uh, you know, it's like if you know classical conditioning, you might get some points and that's fun. Um, you know, we've recently put on a, a series of talks called the psychology of because in COVID, we, we want to find more ways to get people together. So we had one a few weeks ago, the psychology of COVID, where about 100 undergraduates came and listened to a faculty panel talk about what our fields tell us about how we're all coping with COVID and what we can be doing to kind of weather this storm together better. And then we have one coming up in a couple maybe next week 
on the psychology of studying. So we can give you some study tips and you find yourself always procrastinating. Well, we can tell you why and maybe hopefully give you some tips to get out of doing that. Um, we also have an official ch national chapter of Psychi, which is the Honor Society in Psychology. This isn't as much an active club where there's events as much as it is something that once you're more senior and you're about to graduate, you can apply for. If your GPA is high enough, you'll be accepted. And then it's an honor to put on your CV or resume in going forward. Okay. The main thing um, that we do as psychology G majors though, in terms of experiential learning, so giving you hands-on experience is in research. Um, a quick plug about why to do research. So obviously this is the best way to learn about psychology and human behavior. You can take all the classes you want, you can watch all the TED talks you want, but to actually truly understand where these findings are coming from, why we know what we know about human behavior, why we don't know what we don't know about human behavior, and kind of how to know more, again, this hands-on research experience is really, really valuable. So maybe you do this because you really love it, or maybe you do it because you wanna be something like an applied psychologist, maybe a therapist or a forensic psychologist. And so you'll do research now, so you understand the scientific basis of the work you're gonna be applying in your career later. Um, that's a really strong reason to do it, just to better understand, um, even if you don't love it intrinsically like many of us do. Beyond that though, um, doing psychology in a lab delivers you a ton of like core skills that are needed for any job. So for example, here's a list of what Forbes, the magazine um, says are the top 10 reasons employers say they have had to let go of employees in the past or the reasons they fire their employees. All of these, I'm not gonna spend time on this. This isn't a great use of our time, but all of these are things that you get in doing research. Beyond that, all of these things are things that faculty can help you develop. If we see you're having problems with them, we can help. And then you have these skills when you go on past your undergraduate degree that mean you're more employable. You have letters of recommendation from us saying, we know they have these things, we saw it, um, and you know helps you get the career you want. So how do you get involved in psych research? We have tons of events. We do a research fair every semester where all of us who do research, all of our, the faculty and graduate students and undergraduates come together and present our research, talk about what our research is in a big poster session. There's an official arts and science poster session that undergraduates present their work at um, to attend. If you're from a group that's typically underrepresented in science, we have a program for summer um, research where you get one-on-one -on -one mentoring from a faculty member. All of this information, there's more on all of these things that can be found on the um, psychology department's website. If you want to know more about the exact kinds of research we do, we have a website for that as well. I didn't really think through the screen sharing part of this. I was going to, I think we're running low on time too, so I'm not going to, but here's the um, website where you can see about all of our labs and learn about the kinds of research we're doing. All of us have our own personal lab websites there where you can read about the projects. All of us have how to get involved. We have links to the applications, what you learn from um, being in our labs, what kinds of experiences you'd get working with us. All of that's there. If you click on, or not, you can't click on this link, obviously this is a presentation that I'm giving, but if you uh, go to this link um, or just go to the psychology um, department's website and then click around, you'll find this. The one lab that's worth, I mean, they're all worth looking at, but the close relationships lab is really by far and away the best lab. And I don't just say that because it's my lab, it's actually the best lab. Um, I'm definitely just saying that because it's my lab, but check that one out. And if you're interested in hearing more, let me know. That's all I have for you today. I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Dr. Amesha. And I'm sorry for mispronouncing your name. The whole- That's um, okay. I, so many I did the first year I knew it too. <laughs> That's how it's been in my head the entire time, but now I know. So Dr. Misha, again, is a representative from the psychology department. I have had a couple of questions in the chat that I'd like to direct to Dr. Misha now before we move on to Dr. Jones's presentation about neuroscience. Um, first, I had a question from a student, which I already answered because it was a private message. So I answered privately for the student, but I think that Dr. Misha could chime in on this. This student wonders um, a little bit more how much science and math can you take as a psychology major without doing a double major? So essentially how customizable is the psychology major yeah. toward math and science? And I know the answer to this, but I think from Dr. Misha, um, she could give you much better detail. Well, I hope I give you the right answer since you know it. Um, 
Uh, the psychology major is incredibly flexible. It's a 30 credit major um, as they all are, but we don't require a particular ordering of classes. I presented it in the way we want you to take them. So you start with intro, then you do method stats, then you do the conceptual core, then you, but you could take all of them in two semesters. If you felt like it, they'd be bad semesters because there'd be a lot of classes, but you can mix and match. So it makes it so, so, so flexible. You can always work in lecture labs. You can always work in sequences of classes in other departments. Most psych majors have a double major um, or take lots of other classes. So it's flexibility is on purpose. We know that psychology is kind of a really nice add on to other majors for lack of a better term. Like if you're really passionate about advertising, so you're in new house, we know psychology will help you. If you're in the iSchool and you really care about computer science, we know psychology will help you there too. We know it'll help with any discipline you wanna pursue. So we've made our degree flexible so you can work other stuff in that interests you. Is that the correct answer, Rachel? That would have been my answer as well. Very flexible, okay. use your electives. The major is flexible. All Syracuse majors are, are essentially like that. Very easy to complete a major in four years, too easy. Students graduate early when they do one major. Uh, so that means there's a lot of flexibility for you. And even if you do wanna add on the second major, right? Go for it, you know, dive into the other area that you're interested in. Um, I did see the question about doing research at Upstate. I would like to hold that to the end because I think both of our presenters in our general Q&A would like to talk about and can certainly talk about research opportunities outside the university as well as inside. Same thing for your question, Alexandra, about doing ongoing research, prerequisites and requirements. I think both presenters could talk about that at the end of the session. Um, I will talk about costs with you, Tony, privately in the chat because that's not a psychology or neuroscience question and I don't wanna take away from our presenters time, but happily via email in a separate Zoom, I will talk to anyone about cost of tuition, scholarships, financial aid, all of that. Um, Dr. Mesha, do we offer a doctoral program for psychology? Yeah, we have four doctoral programs, not to complicate matters, but <laughs> we offer four, one in social psychology, one in clinical psychology, one in school psychology, and then one in cognitive psychology. So because of the four PhD programs, we have faculty with expertise in those four areas. We have graduate students pursuing PhDs in those four areas. Um, it makes for a really deep understanding of the kind of core areas of our field. The PhDs take five years to complete, except for school, which takes four years to complete. Um, and uh, clinical is, is five, but then typically you'll also have to, like with school as well. So school and clinical are APA accredited. You get the coursework done in four for school, five for clinical, but then they both require an APA accredited internship, which happens the year after. Um, your coursework is completed. So those tend to be like five and six then, but you're only on campus for four and then five. And then cognitive and social are not APA accredited. So we just do all the coursework, people finish in five years. And then last question before we move on to Dr. Jones, uh, is it possible to have an advisor outside of the psychology department? Yeah, yeah so um, many people do. Uh, whether that's, you know, so we offer formal, like we offer this faculty mentor um, and, and that's formal to make sure there's at least one person, right, that you, that you know has set the time aside for you. But if you find somebody outside of the psych department that you connect with, get all the advice you can from as many people as you want. If you want an official faculty mentor outside the psych department, I don't know. So departments typically do that themselves. I know if I were, if someone were like a math major and came to me and was like, I kind of want to do some psych stuff, but I'm not a psych major. Can I have a faculty mentor? I'd say, sure. If you want a faculty mentor, we'll give you one. So I assume that like, if you wanted one in math, they would do the same, but I can't promise you that because I'm not them. Yes. So I would say, I hear that a lot from our faculty. It's not just Dr. Mesha who's nice and wants to mentor students. The same way that students get intimidated about going to their high school teachers outside of class for help, students get intimidated by going to their psychology professor or their neuroscience professor or their engineering professor outside of class for help and advising. So our faculty are constantly trying to drag students in to their office hours, get them in their office, give them help, give them mentorship. So I would be shocked to hear of any faculty who turned away a student who wanted advice um, at Syracuse. That's just something that faculty always want to do more with students. So yes, I agree with Dr. Misha. 
Um, it would be very easy to go ask for advising. And then the Art College of Arts and Sciences, like Dr. Misha mentioned during her presentation, does also offer general advising resources. So it's not just one person in psychology who will be advising you. Um, I got a private message and, and I'll just mention this really quick, quickly before I go to Dr. Jones's presentation about someone who has to leave early. If that applies to any of you, it's not rude. Don't worry about it. Head out if you need to head out. I can send you a recording of the session uh, tomorrow if, if that's something you want. Uh, but I would encourage you to stay live if you can so that you can ask questions as they come up. I know I have a few other questions. I'll be responding to those in the chat. Some of you have been sending me private messages. So while Dr. Jones is giving her presentation, I'll be responding to you. And then after her presentation, we'll open back up uh, to respond to Q&A about neuroscience and then have some dual Q&A with both presenters. So keep the questions coming if they're on your mind. Ready for me, Rachel? Yes, thank okay. you. So I am going to try to share this. Let's try this. Okay. You see, you see this, right? So it's neuroscience at SU. You guys are good? All right. So I am Dr. Jones. I am the director of our integrated learning major, and I'm going to talk about what that means in a second. Um, and so we're excited to have you and um, would love it if you all came and majored in neuroscience. So our program um, actually has uh, about 225 students um, at this point. So I, I call it a program because neuroscience isn't a department, which means that um, the major is not available as a standalone major. So um, you couldn't major in neuroscience as you would psychology, for example. It's not a comprehensive major um, with 36-ish you know, plus credits. Um, it is considered an integra integrated learning major, which is different from a traditional major. So it's pretty impressive that we have 225 students in the program, given that they have to basically almost double major to, um, to add the neuroscience program to their degree. About, I would say, this is kind of anecdotal. This isn't really data, you know, I haven't analyzed a bunch of data on a spreadsheet for this, but anecdotally, I would tell you that at least 60% of our students um, or more are doing research. So many of our students um, are also in the honors program on campus. Um, however, they are not all in the honors program. Many of them do research. Many of our students are pre-med, so they are, um, are looking to go to medical school. Um, and then I would say at least, a, I would say a good 50% of our students study abroad. So they go all over the place. Um, they go as far as Australia and New Zealand, um, and I guess as close as maybe England or Ireland would be maybe as close. Um, and so they go everywhere. Not all of the abroad programs would have classes that would include neuroscience, that would count towards neuroscience. Um, but usually students use the abroad experience to fill more um, uh, liberal arts and sciences requirements. So they'll go and you know, just take some writing classes or you know, some uh, foreign language classes um, and things like that to fill those uh, slots. But um, even with doing the integrated learning major, still many of our study, students do study abroad. We actually only have three core faculty, so it sounds weird, right? But we actually only have um, our executive director. So right now her name is Natalie Russo. Um, she's our interim director. And then in the spring, um, Sandra Hewitt, our usual executive director, will be back from research leave. Uh, myself, so I'm an associate teaching professor um, and I'm the director of the ILM. And then um, our third core faculty member is uh, our newest faculty member. Her name is Jen Cook and she's um, also an assistant teaching professor. So there's just the three of us, which seems weird, but actually because we're an integrated learning major, our program depends on the contributions of faculty from all across campus in all different departments. So as you imagine, neuroscience is um, a broad field and can encompass uh, content from many, many, many different areas. So even fields like linguistics do contribute in small ways to our program as well. So um, there's a lot 
there's a lot to such a to such a tiny program and it's thanks to um, the faculty members from across campus that help teach in our program. So what is this integrated learning major I've been talking about? Well, it's a major that um, first must be paired with another primary major. So you can't come to Syracuse right now and major in neuroscience and that's it. You have to major in neuroscience plus your quote primary major. So the primary major, and I'll get into this, but it could be really any other major on campus. Um, and that would be considered your primary major, the one that contains all the liberal arts and sciences um, requirements. It um, includes all of the major courses for that particular major. Um, so it's not what we call a standalone major. It has to be paired with another major. So yes, it is a, a form of a double major, but in fact, it's fewer credits. So um, normal major would average about 36-ish credits, 30, maybe 36 credits, whereas um, the neuroscience major is 24 credits. So you do end up with a double major. At the end of the program, you would end up with a degree in neuroscience that mirrors your primary major. So if you got a Bachelor of Arts in Biology, you would get a Bachelor of Arts in Neuroscience. If you got a Bachelor of Science in Biology, you would get a Bachelor of Science um, in Neuroscience. So you do end up with that double major designation on your, um, on your degree at the end. Um, and so the integrated piece of the major is um, really, uh, a representation of the breadth and depth in the program. And so they used to call it a T major, right? So like the T, the, this part is your depth and then the cross part is the breadth. The T, the, the stick part of the T um, really indicates uh, learning in the primary major. And then the across, the breadth um, also is uh, the, the breadth provided um, by the neuroscience program in addition to get to some of that depth, you would take two electives um, that are outside of your primary major to dive a little bit deeper into the neuroscience field. So it's about getting breadth and depth um, across the field of neuroscience and then including your primary major. So the program, as I said, is 24 credits and we have two introductory courses. Right now I teach both of those. Um, and one is introduction, they look very similar, right? Introduction to neuroscience and introduction to cognitive neuroscience. So um, the first one being the biological side of it and the second one being more of the psychological side of it. So introduction to neuroscience itself is looking at how do neurons signal? What's the ion flow across um, the membranes? How do um, photoreceptors change light into electrical signals? How are those signals passed to the brain? So um, a lot of you know, uh, uh, coding for movement, coding for sensory signals from the skin, um, the autonomic nervous system. So a lot of biological based um, perspectives in that course. Um, well, 100% pure <laughs> biological based perspective. The cognitive neuroscience, introduction to cognitive neuroscience, would look at a lot of the same topics, but it will look at them from the cognitive perspective. So for example, in uh, the biological side, I might look at all the, um, the neuron details, uh, the signaling details of how we get um, light signals and the, everything I'm seeing out here. How does that all get transmitted to the brain? And in intro to cognitive neuroscience, we learn about how once it's there, what happens to it, what um, connections are found in different regions of the brain um, to interpret what I'm seeing out here and how is my perception different from somebody else's. And also we talk a lot about uh, the ways in which we know these things. So the methods of um, neuroscience. Um, cognitive psychology or cognitive science, that's a choice between two classes. It's not a name for two different, <laughs> the same class. Um, but cognitive psychology um, is part of the psychology department um, and, again, gives you a better feel for um, actual cognition. Cognitive science, I believe, is offered through philosophy. Um, and it, is, it gives you more of a, um, a machines-based look at uh, neuroscience. 
Advanced neuroscience is um, the advanced version of introduction to neuroscience. So it's the next in that sequence. Um, and so that's a, a biological based course. Cognitive neuroscience of speech and language is um, a course offered through communication sciences and disorders and really looks at um, the um, brain connections that are involved in creating uh, speech and language and understanding speech and language. And then um, I believe that she uses a lot of patient cases because she's a clinician. Um, she uses a lot of patient cases to um, present this information. Um, Neuroscience and Society is our course that um, involves students in a lot of discussion. So this course is really unique in the program because it's less about learning a bunch of content and more about applying that content that you've learned to um, looking at the research. How is neuroscience represented in the news? How is it represented in the arts? Is this accurate? Um, ethics, that kind of thing. So it's a heavily discussion-based course um, and involves, you know, usually like your papers and your presentations and things like that. And then finally, you would take two electives outside the primary major. So um, let me come back to that in a second, but those that would fill your last six credits, these two electives. So what majors could I pair with neuroscience? So common primary majors are psychology, by far is our most popular paired major, biology, um, I forgot biochemistry, biotechnology, public health, chemistry, and communication sciences and disorders. So those are, that being said, those are our most popular, which means that um, for any you know, given uh, major declaration form that comes through, these are gonna be the most common uh, second or primary majors that come through uh, to sign up with neuroscience. But really you can major in anything um, and pair it with neuroscience. In, in this, at Syracuse, you really just have to um, do a little bit more paperwork, a couple of extra signatures um, to pair it with anything you want. So I do have majors um, I have people that major in Spanish, I have people that major in French, I have people that major in economics, I have people that major in exercise science, um, I have two or three majors um, within Newhouse, so the communication school. Um, so students really come from all over campus um, to major in neuroscience. So you can really pair it with anything. So coming back to that, um, two electives outside the primary major. Basically, um, let me see if I still have this up. I do. So if you look at this advising sheet, this long list that I'm scrolling through right now is our electives. So these are the approved electives that we say contain enough neuroscience or pertain enough to neuroscience that we would allow you to count them as electives for the major. But let's say, for instance, you decide that your primary major is going to be biology. Then that means that you may not take the, any of those classes and count them towards your electives as in the neuroscience program. But you could choose two electives from any of the rest of this list of um, electives. So it's a quite an in-depth list of um, courses from different departments. But it's that idea that if your primary major is philosophy, you would pick two electives from this list that are outside of philosophy. So that we're giving you that idea of breadth um, and then still looking a little deeper into the neuroscience portion of your degree. So that's that. Let me go back. Oh, there we go. All right. So um, that's majors. All right. So neuroscience advising. So we do provide advising um, in the program. Um, we assign uh, an advisee to all of our majors. You do get an advisor when you declare. Um, and we do help you plan neuroscience specific courses for the program. And we do regular check ins with our students, um, usually once a semester. Um, you'll come to see us just to be sure that you're on track and you're, you're meeting all the requirements on time. Um, and then for clubs in our, in our program, we do have the Honor Society. So we have NeuroSci that just started, um, oh wow, just pre-COVID. We always say everything is 
before COVID and after COVID. Um, it started this semester, uh, I want to say the first real group of them was the fall before um, COVID, so it was about last fall. Um, and so we have a lot of events that had been planned for the spring, um, particularly during uh, Brain Awareness Week. So this group was supposed to um, plan and implement a lot of uh, brain awareness activities on campus. Um, and then of course we had to go home um, when brain awareness week occurred. So the students didn't get a chance to do a lot of that. Um, you can see what the criteria are here. We do a formal induction ceremony every semester um, and then students, I spelled activity. Um, are involved in many activities. So, you know, it's been tough because of course we haven't had a lot of time to get the things together because we've been stuck at home. Um, but I imagine that once things go back to normal, um, the, the Honor Society students will be hosting a lot of activities. Um, the Neuroscience Club is a registered club on campus. Um, their advisor is actually a professor in uh, public health. And all this, any student can join that club. There's no prerequisites or any of that. Um, and they um, actually have been interested in providing tutoring um, for the students in the introductory courses. Um, and they started that little program, but of course that got shut down again um, since we had to go online. So um, that's basically what we have for clubs. And then finally, research. So our students are very involved in research, as I said earlier. We have neuroscience faculty from all of these departments and further um, across campus. Um, students, a lot of students choose um, to do research. It's They usually do research within their primary major, but they may pick um, a uh, an advisor to work with or a faculty member to work with that whose project also represents neuroscience. Certainly you don't have to do that, even if you're a neuroscience major. But many students, because they're interested in neuroscience, um, pick a faculty member in these departments that is um, that also represents uh, neuroscience. And then finally down here, um, SUNY Upstate is our neighbor down the hill. So that's our um, medical university in Syracuse. And um, they have a very large uh, research so much out there. Leaving. And um, so many of our students will go down there and um, get linked up with somebody down at Upstate and carry out their research projects down there. And I think that has been actually a good experience for most of the students that I've had that have done it, have enjoyed it, um, and have found good uh, mentorship down there as well. I think. Oh no, what could you do with a bachelor's degree in neuroscience? So of course, most of our students do go to graduate school. Most of them go to graduate school um, for things generally either in clinical areas or in research areas. Um, so many of our students, um, if they're in psychology, they may go on to um, psychology graduate programs. Um, if they're in biology, they may go on to biological graduate programs. Those can always have a neuroscience spin to them um, and often do. Um, so, you know, they'll go on to those kinds of programs. Uh, some go to medical school, some go to become physician assistants. Um, some, I'm trying to remember, I feel like there's something I'm leaving out, but you know, you've got dental school. We have, I know I have one right now applying to dental school um, and then sometimes vet school. Um, but in terms of the bachelor's degree, um, you can see this is just a long laundry list that I actually just took right from our website um, of things that we found that our students are doing um, outside of um, once they've graduated. So a lot of times students will decide, I want to go to graduate school, but I don't want to go right now. And so they'll look for jobs right after. Um, many of our students work in these research assistant or clinical research assistant roles right after college. Um, but certainly, we just had an alumni come and present. Um, uh, he's a pharmaceutical sales representative. And he came to our, um, our neuroscience day that we had last Friday. It was on Zoom. It was through Gather Town. It was really cute. Um, 
And so the student, you know, if you were in the program, you could come and ask questions and things like that. So we had some alumni that came and um, one was in graduate school and the other one was a pharmaceutical sales representative. And so he came and talked about that. Um, but now I think that I'm done. Yes. So um, this is my email and this um, is our neuroscience website if you ever want to go and check that out. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Jones. You're welcome. You all probably are not seeing this because I'm getting a ton of private messages, but I have been going to town in the chat answering all of your <laughs> questions. So thank you so much for chiming in with those questions. Uh, most of you have answered and hopefully you've seen those answers. Um, really quickly, I've had three, four people ask me about cost and tuition and financial aid. We don't have time to go into that tonight because again, we're all here to focus our time with our professors on psychology and neuroscience. I am more than happy to have as long a conversation you want about those topics. They are an important part of the process. I'm not pushing those questions to the side. This is just not the best time to discuss those questions. Email me, set up a separate Zoom call with me. I'm more than happy to sit down with you and I will go ahead and drop my email address in the chat now. So you can just copy and paste that um, and go ahead and send me an email and we'll set up a time to talk either in person, in person on Zoom or via email. So I have a few questions. Um, some of them, Dr. Jones, you are answering not knowing it as students were messaging me privately and you kind of cover those topics. So some of them have already been knocked out. Um, one student wants to know, can I be involved in neuroscience research my freshman year? And I think this would be a good question for Dr. Mesha to chime in on as well, because I think psychology students probably want to know um, this also. So yes, you can. So you can join a research group anytime um, in your career at Syracuse. I mean, some people even don't do it until they're seniors. So yes, and we always, we do encourage um, you to start looking for uh, somebody that you might like to do research with um, early so that you can have that connection early on and get in, you know, get in uh, and hit the ground running. Even if you do um, some, you know, small, tasks within that lab. Um, I call it a lab, but it's the biology side. We don't all have like labs. I know that, but, um, but you know, you want to get in and get, you know, working with people that, you know, get, get in there and get some small tasks that you can do so that you can get familiar with the group and the kind of work that they do. Um, and if you start early, um, sometimes you might find that you want to switch, you know, you might want to work in this lab for a little while, learn some skills, and then you might think, well, you know, now that I've had some experience, I'm really interested in this, and you might find that you want to do something else, which broadens your ability to get some experience. Um, but that's not to say that it's also, it's, in, it's really invaluable to spend, you know, if you were able to spend a good three to four years in a lab, um, you would get some really, really, really good data, um, hopefully, and um, you would have a chance to learn a lot of valuable skills um, that you could take with you either into the workplace or into graduate school. Laura, what's your take? Yeah, I mean, uh, not every psychology major does do research. Um, that might be a differentiation between neuroscience and psych. A lot of our students, um, uh, 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 the ones who want to go into psychology do, but um, many don't. So this means that if you're a psychology major who wants to do research and you know that very early on, we are thrilled to have you because we like Robin or Dr. Jones was saying, we can um, start to develop those like more in-depth research projects with you uh, and, and really start getting like publications and, and stuff out of that work, which would really help you in going on. So yes, early is good, late is good. We're happy when people want to do research. Yes, absolutely. Any research experience is good. And and exactly, we do see students going into research early. Sometimes professors will want to see that you have a track record of understanding the topic that you want to research, right? So we can be transparent with you about that. Not every professor wants to work with the first day on campus freshmen. There are also other important things you need to be focusing on. As much as I will be a proponent for research and someone who encourages students about that, your very first week on campus is not the time to go barking up faculty trees about getting into their labs, make friends with the people in your dorm, learn where the dining hall is, go to one of each of your classes, 
right? And then start doing that. But during your freshman year, especially toward the end, certainly students have done that. Um, it's, it shouldn't be the first thing you do. There are many other things that will benefit you in the long run socially that you should be doing when you first get to college. Um, okay, one more question I think we can cover um, before we wrap up tonight. And I'll kind of broaden this question to encompass a few questions that I've gotten from the audience. And this is about internship experiences. Um, I have a list of psychology internship examples that I can send. I have sent students in the past. I will send that to anyone in the room who wants it. Um, but I think it would be great if, if both faculty could give an example of a research project that a student has done. So a specific student, what they're interested in. And also if you know of any, a research, or sorry, an internship experience that a student has done, if you have them. And if not, that's okay. But students have kind of been asking, what kinds of projects do students do? Where can students go? The, the answer to that is that students can do any, really any kind of research they want, right? You can't just pull a question out of thin air and answer that question at Syracuse. You would generally have to find a faculty member who's interested in that general area, get some experience. But by the time you graduate, you probably could do that, right? Within reason, within the limits of what research can do. Um, internship examples, same thing. You can intern anywhere you want. Syracuse will support you in doing that. They will help make you competitive for the internships you want to get, whether it's at some nonprofit startup with three employees or at Disney, right? Different students want different things. Syracuse will support you in reaching those goals. Um, so there is not a single question, what do students do? Well, here are the internships they do. We can't really answer that question that way because students do a lot of different things. Um, and it totally depends on what they want and where they want to go, what kind of research they want to do, what kind of career they're looking for. But I think our faculty can probably give you just a couple of examples to start getting the gears turning. Or for those of you who aren't really sure what undergraduate research or undergraduate internships look like, just get an idea of, of what students might be doing. So if we could start with Dr. Jones and then wrap up with Dr. Mesha. Um, the questions that are coming in now, we will not have time to answer, but I do encourage you to send me an email. I'll put my email in the chat again. Dr. Mesha and Dr. Jones can do the same and we can follow up with you via email. So um, but in neuroscience, you know, we have tons of students doing research across the board. So they, the projects range literally like through so many departments. Um, but a couple of them, you know, that come to mind. So um, one lab, well, it's really, two, it's really two labs. So the Hewitts, Dr. Hewitts, <laughs> there's two of them. Um, they actually both uh, work on different um, neurological disorders. So um, Sandra Hewitt uh, looks at stroke models in mice. So students that work in her lab will actually study um, how astrocytes, which is a, it's a kind of um, glial or helper cell in the brain, how astrocytes contribute to um, stroke recovery. So um, they're looking at mechanisms by which astrocytes um, might be processing particular neurotransmitters um, in order to uh, speed up or slow down healing in a stroke model. So how could in ultimately trying to answer the question, can we find mechanisms by which we can improve um, outcomes in stroke patients? Um, and Dr. Hewitt, um, Jim Hewitt, his um, model is epilepsy. So he looks at um, genetic, I wanna say it's like neurogenetics um, in terms of um, what, what may or may not um, predispose you to um, having epileptic seizure um, and specifically looking at the hippocampus in terms of that. So that's, on, that's really on the biology side. Um, my background is in biology and I sit in biology. So I'm, in bio, I'm around these people all the time. Um, but certainly that being said, um, we have so many projects and I'm glad Laura's here because she can speak to the psychology side of this. Um, in psychology, so many students doing projects in psychology and they are so fascinating. Um, and so I know she's gonna be able to talk about that better. Um, in terms of internships, um, I can't give you a, a list of internships. Students generally find their internships if they wanna do that kind of experience on their own. 
a lot of our students will do summer research programs that they'll find and apply to um, in different areas of the country. They may go to, um, there are a lot of these um, summer programs for like pre-med students if you want to go and get some experience like in the medical field and looking at, you know, taking some of their classes. Uh, maybe you do a research project while you're there. Um, I have had a couple of students actually do internships in industry that they lined up themselves. So when I say industry, I mean like pharmaceuticals and biotechnology. They um, sought out, maybe they're from New York City, maybe they're from DC, maybe they're from Baltimore. So they're in areas um, that have a rich, um, a rich population of these types of companies. And they'll set up internships where they can go in the summer and they can work alongside um, uh, people that work in the labs or in marketing. I mean, they might go into marketing, so they might want to do an internship in that. Um, but having a science background helps if you want to do marketing for a company, a pharmaceutical company or a biotech company. All right. So uh, psychology is a diverse field here as well. So I've been like racking my brain and stuck on like, oh, which one's more interesting? I wasn't pre-warned about this question. So I'm just gonna tell you about my own research. Uh, we, we have a ton, we have, we have labs where they're administering alcohol to people to see how that changes their cognitive processing. We have animal model labs where people are like teaching um, mice how to learn things after depriving them um, of social interaction or having them socially interact first. We have people studying autism and the neuroscience of that. Dr. Natalie Russo, the um, interim executive director of the ILM is a psychology faculty member. We have people in schools learning how kids learn better. We have, you know, we, it's so diverse. But the best research, as I mentioned before, is happening in the close relationship lab. Again, not just because it's my lab, because it's the best. So I'm working with an honor student right now who's doing a capstone project. It's related to my work, but um, she's sort of like sprung board off and her project is looking at this concept called attachment style. So briefly in childhood, we kind of get these ideas about like what relationships can give us. So are they safe? Are they where we meet our needs or are they kind of risky? Like people can abandon us or um, like, you know, and, and we make these ideas about, and so then when we get into adulthood, these kind of carry on. And so as a, an, a young adult, we think about things like, okay, if I'm dating somebody, do I think they're going to abandon me? Or do I kind of like, and what do I do about that? If I say yes. So if I say, yes, I think they're going to abandon me. Do I like cling to them? And I, do I get really jealous? Do I really like want them always around me? Or do I kind of think I don't want to get close because they're just going to hurt me? Those are kind of two ways we see people react to this fear about being abandoned. Not everyone has it, but those who do, those are the two ways we go. So if you're a partner of somebody who has this fear of abandonment, who's kind of manifesting in one of those two ways, you might want to support your partner. And we know there's different ways to support people. Some of them are like, I can just diffuse the situation, right? I can make a joke and say, I'm not trying to abandon you. Don't even worry about it. Well, that's not great for the clingy person, but it is for the one who's like trying to not get close in the first place. Um, and what, and the other, you know, a different way I could diffuse this situation if you're worried about me abandoning you is I could like really come full court press and make sure you know I'm here all the time. Um, and so what we see in what this study is looking at, she's um, having people, she measures their attachment style. So we know, are you clingy or are you kind of like independent and avoidant? And then we say, imagine your partner gave you this kind of support in a moment when you were feeling worried about abandonment. And then we see if that makes them feel better or worse afterwards, depending on their style. So we're using these kind of imagined scenarios. Typically we bring couples into the lab and have them act these things out for us, but um, COVID, so uh, we're doing it this way. So that's just one example of like a study we're, we're working on now or we're you know, in the lab. But like I said, the field is super diverse. Our faculty are super diverse. Check out the links on the website to see all the kinds of labs. People describe their projects there. In terms of an internship, um, we used to have a formal internship program, but it gets really tricky because as it turns out, as a psychology undergraduate student, you can't actually give people psychological services. So we found um, most internships that are directly related to psychology in the community tend to be kind of like 
janitorial work. Like, oh, you can clean the kitchen area of the psychiatric center, but you can't really like it. So um, instead, like, you know, students can find their own. So if you have a connection, you have a lead on this, that's great. Um, but in-house in psychology, we do have faculty doing um, research, but on topics that give students internship experience. So um, one of our faculty in clinical studies, uh, ADHD, um, attention deficit and hyperactive disorder in children. And once per week, he posts a social skills training for these kids with ADHD and their parents, um, where he provides like training on how to um, interact in a more productive way for these kids who are, have this like kind of severe uh, form of ADHD. And undergraduate students who are working with Dr. Anschel um, in the clinical, he, they get an internship experience of kind of shadowing him, delivering these interventions for these kids with ADHD. So technically it's a research experience, but it looks a lot like an internship where you're looking at how a clinician is working with his, um, in this case, clients, so. Okay, so again, those are not the only examples of ways that you can do neuroscience or ways that you can do psychology research or internships. We would be here until tomorrow, probably longer than until tomorrow, if we were to try to give you every example of ways that you can be involved in these fields. Neuroscience can be about people, it can be about cells, it can be about molecules, it can be about animals, it can be about fish, right? And, and many other things in between, right? Psychology, same story, right? And in both of these fields, it might even be about computers might be about an artificial intelligence. Maybe it's computer science. So there are literally so many different ways that you can take this. That's not me trying to get out of a complicated question. It's just that it's going to be an individual conversation with each of you about what you're interested in, what you can do at Syracuse. And those are conversations that I would love to have. So if you have questions that we haven't answered yet, I know there are some in the chat. Again, not avoiding them. We're just out of time. So email me those questions. I'm happy to talk with you one-on-one, -on -one, set up a separate Zoom call. We will get to the bottom of whatever you're wondering. Same thing goes for questions about tuition, cost, financial aid, all of that. Do not email either of these professors about those questions. That is not their job. They don't have those answers for you. I do. I'm happy to respond to those questions. Uh, so again, thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, I've really enjoyed hearing from both of our professors tonight. So thank you, Dr. Jones. Thank you, Dr. Mesha, for being here this evening. Students, be very grateful of this. It is not their job to help me with these sessions. They are at home in, in the evening talking to all of you instead of hanging out with their family, sitting on the couch, relaxing as professors need to do after a long day on Zoom. So please give them your thanks. We appreciate both of you being here tonight. And to the students, thank you for contributing some of your attention to the session tonight. I know you're all on Zoom too much, and I appreciate that you are taking the time to spend with us um, and getting more screen time than you probably should today uh, for our sake. So. Thank you again for being here tonight. We will log off at this point. And again, please do email me if you didn't have your questions answered tonight or if more things come up as you're trying to go to sleep and now you're thinking about robots and how they might form relationships. So thank you for joining us tonight. We'll talk to you again next time. 